Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, this is not my usual gig. <laughs> and sometimes I kind of struggle with like, what am I going to say that, you know, you haven't heard from me in classes or you haven't heard from me the other times I've spoken. And really the, the main, my main question is, how can I support you? What can I do that will help you? What can I do that will inspire you? And when I kind of sit with that, the answer comes up, nothing. <laughs> Which makes 20 minutes look like a really long time. <laughs> but I do sit with that and, and ask, you know, what do these souls need? What can I do? What can I do since I'm here? And the only thing that I can do, because ultimately we do for ourselves, you do for yourself. But what I can do is offer tools that have been tried and true in my world, in my experience, and hopefully something is inspiring enough for you to take it with you and do something with it today, tomorrow for the next seven days until I speak again next week. <laughs> and that thing that you do for you is first to make a commitment to something that you want for you. Something that you want for you. And that commitment is your guide, your pole star. The pole star in the northern hemisphere, every, anyway, I don't know about the southern hemisphere, but in the northern hemisphere, the pole star is Polaris, because it's close enough to the pole, the North Pole, that it doesn't set and it doesn't rise. So it's there, rain or shine, day or night, any time of year, and so navigators would use that to mark their location so that they knew they were headed in the right direction. So your commitment is your pole star. There may be a storm that comes along, but you can bring yourself back to your pole star, your commitment, and it's there for you. It's rock solid. And you think of those, I think of those travelers working with that pole star. And I think it shouldn't be overlooked that they didn't just set their compasses and set their navigation to the star and then sit back and see what's happening on Twitter for the rest of the day. Right? Netflix. They had work to do to keep themselves in alignment with their course. And that nobody can do for us. We are our own crew. No matter who we're living with, no matter who and how great our friends are, we are our own crew. And we are the ones who keep ourselves on course. No matter what, no matter what comes up. So if your commitment, say, is to meditate for five minutes every day, then that's your pole star in your your crew has to back you up. The crew of you has to back you up. So if you're doing that five minutes in the morning, then your crew needs to make sure you get out of bed and do that. If in the evening, even though there are still 50 things to do before bedtime, your, you as your crew needs to say, okay, those things will have to wait because this is my commitment. This is my commitment to change right now. And everything else is less important. Everything else is less important. I discovered Audible in the last couple of weeks. Don't know how it took me this long, but um, my first book that I've been listening to is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Awesome. She's a goddess anyway, but this book has really 
moving and touching me. And in it, she's quoting, um, she quoted Mar Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor, who I don't know what the historical context was, but the quote she's using is, what stands in the way becomes the way. What stands in the way becomes the way. Which is not a really happy thought if you think about it. It's powerful. So when we're not paying attention, when we make our commitment, if we're not paying attention, those blocks that come up whenever we naturally, they come up naturally whenever we make a commitment, then we will go, oh, there's a block in the way. It's too hard. This maybe must not be the right thing. And then we go. So if we're thinking of a road, like we like to in our spiritual journey, we like to use the analogy of, of a road that we're traveling on our, on our lives, on our spiritual journey. And in a real road, we're driving along, and if there's a block, we have to turn, right? But the difference is, on our spiritual journey, if there's a block, that's information. That's information that we can do something about. We can go, okay, do I have any control over this block in the road? Yes, great, what do I do with it? No, I don't have any control over this. Okay, then I need to step aside and find my pull star and go, okay, how do I get there now? There's a big mass in my way, how do I get there now? And maneuver around it. But that's information, and that's forward movement, even though there's a block. So part of our experience of fulfilling our commitment to ourselves is embracing the fact that whatever we're doing that is stretching us into something greater that we know we can be, our resistance in anything unlike the fulfillment of that commitment is going to come up. It just is. It's not because God doesn't like you. It's not because you're not good enough. It's because you have a pulse, you are human, and this is the way it works, <laughs> no matter what. So, so only when we're not willing to embrace that does what stand, stands in the way become the way for us. Otherwise, what stands in the way becomes an opportunity to grow and stretch and think and recalculate. One of the things that comes up for people when I'm talking to them in, in my work, or friends, or any, any time I'm talking to another human being about keeping commitments, a lot of times what I hear, and I'm sure you've heard this from your friends and family too, is, well, I tried that, but, <laughs> fill in the blank, right? I tried that, but, But when you think about it in life, when you have a commitment to somebody else or for somebody else, let's say, because that's so much easier to fulfill than our commitments to ourselves, let's face it. The other day, I was driving to my Chicago office, and I don't know how this happened, but instead of North Michigan Avenue, my GPS thought I meant South Michigan Avenue. So, which I didn't realize because I am directionally impaired until I almost got to the South Michigan Avenue location and I went, this is not where I work. <laughs> so I checked the address, I go, how did that happen? I am going to be late. And I put the correct address in there by hand and got to my location 20 minutes after I, I needed to be there. That was kind of an obstacle. But I had to be there. I had that drive to make sure that I showed up for work. So to think about it in that respect where would I have gone, oh, 
I'm in the wrong location. I can't go to work today. And then go home for the rest of the day. No, I'm not going to do that. And we have to have the, we have to give ourselves and our own commitment that respect. That respect of this may not look perfect. I may not do it the way I thought I was doing it, or it was going to happen the way I thought it was going to happen, but it's important. And I have to keep going. I have to keep trying. One thing that, um, and this is a thought that came to me before our 11 o'clock service started today, so you'll have to forgive me because I'm supposed to talk about this and I didn't prepare for it, so I've got to kind of formulate it as I'm going. But one of the things that comes up is the, for people when, when they're working towards their commitment, is that, you know, I've, tr I've tried it before and it didn't work. Or I failed, I tried and failed so many times. Not just that it didn't work, but that I didn't work, that I can't set myself up for failure like that again. And there are things that we do and that we've done in our lifetimes that have failed miserably. Maybe because of us, maybe because of circumstances. And that's just part of life too. But there are, are more. There are more. I guarantee you there are more times when each of us has succeeded with something in our lives than there are that we fail. But the failures stick with us. The successes, well, we take for granted. Of course it succeeded. I worked really hard for that. But when we fail, oh my gosh, it's, it can feel like the end of the world sometimes. It can feel hard. So I want you to think about right now five things. And if you can't think of five, three minimum. Three things that you have succeeded at in your lifetime. And if you have a voice that's coming into your head right now that said there's nothing, then that's the obstacle that needs to be removed. Because it's not true. It's not true. And each and every day, we need to acknowledge our successes, our little accomplishments. Because they're happening and we're not paying attention to those. They're happening all the time. And if we have a desire to do something in our lives, if we have a desire to make a commitment to ourselves, then that's the fact that that desire comes up in us is our soul speaking to us, and we have to embrace it. We have to embrace it. And our souls don't give a darn how many times we think we have failed and how sorry for ourselves we feel about that. <laughs> Our souls say, no, keep trying, keep working. Because every time we make an effort, we're strengthening ourselves. And the outcome doesn't matter. Yes, we want our outcomes. Yes, it's nice when our defined outcomes happen. That's wonderful. But that's not what grows us. What grows us is the process. What grows us is the hard work. The, or maybe not hard work per se, but hard work is part of it, but, but also how we have had to change to embrace and encompass the result that we want. So think about how many changes have you made in your lives and still were able to show up here this morning. How many things have you gone through and were still able to show up here this morning? That is awesome and needs to be acknowledged, not just by me, but by you. And the, the 
Our accomplishments don't, they're not our stopping point. So they don't really fulfill us. When we've achieved something, we need to be grateful to ourselves for that. We need to acknowledge that. But then we're on to the next thing, right? Then we're on to the next thing. So our, our result isn't the stopping goal. So even if it looks like we failed at something, it's not our stopping point either. But we let it be sometimes. And then that's our obstacle. That's our obstacle to say, okay, well that didn't work out like I thought it was going to, but what did I get from it? What did I gain from it? How did it bless me? How did it strengthen me? How did it grow me? And even if you can say, I don't really know, but I can think about it, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Because we don't want what stands in the way to become the way. So that we're headed in this direction, and just because we had obstacles that are taking us round about, that we have ultimately failed somehow, because what, what is it that we're here to do? We've got our, our human personality, personal life things that we're here to fulfill and do, but the universe, that cosmic love, is interested in something far more important than us fulfilling our human goals. That cosmic love is interested in how are you loving yourself? How are you growing? How are you changing? How are you learning how to remove the blocks that stand in your way of feeling that peace inside of you more and more, more throughout each day, not just on Sundays or at Tuesday meditations or your five minutes of meditation that you do get up and do every morning, but all the time throughout the day. Feeling that love, feeling that love so much that whoever you meet, whoever is cutting you off in the street while you're driving, you can see them, you can feel them, you can say, I'm here. I'm here and I'm showing up in love no matter what. And it can be scary and it can be hard and we don't want to do it sometimes because of whatever resentments we may be holding. But then that's our obstacle that we embrace and go, okay, this is standing in my way of feeling that love and peace more. So I am committed. My ultimate commitment is to remove those, those obstacles so that I can be more of that peace. I can move and live more and more in that peace. And that's why we're here. That is why we're here. So, one of the goals I had years ago was, some of you have heard this before, was um, so oh, anyway, let me let me kind of back up on that because it sounds weird that I'm calling this a goal but it was to to have a second child right which had to be a goal because after my first by the time she was four it was like I don't know I'm good <laughs> and I knew there was another soul waiting to come in um, so my oldest, my daughter Rosalie, was born at home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And let me back up before that even. So I was earth mother all the way before my first was born. You know, granola crunching, armpit hair braiding, the whole nine yards. And so that was extremely important to me. That was a huge part of my identity. So we were moving from Albuquerque, New Mexico to Kansas. Greg was getting another job there closer to Unity's headquarters and friends and family that we love. And um, when he was, when we were visiting Kansas from New Mexico, 
on the weekend of this interview, I looked up in their phone book, midwives, because that was my priority. <laughs> Not anything else that was happening. It's like, okay, my next baby's gonna be coming pretty soon. Let's find the way that I can do this my way. And as I was looking through the phone book, kind of trying to get the vibe of the midwives, the, the very, very few midwives that were listed in a Kansas phone book, I was sitting there and I heard this voice that said, your next child will not be born at home. <laughs> and in my tiny, itty bitty, minuscule, rigid worldview, that could only mean one thing, that something terrible was gonna to happen to me, to my child. So now I'm in a state of panic. Fun stuff. Fun stuff when your intuition sends you into a state of panic. But I tried to be obedient, and I put the phone book away for a little while, and then I got it back out and wanted to, was picking up the phone to call because maybe I'll just get information. And I just got, there, there wasn't a voice, there's just this looming feeling like, don't even think about it. Which freaked me out even more, right? So I close a phone book and, you know, Greg's busy doing his thing. So I'm, I'm sitting with this myself. And it's like, okay, I will follow, but I'm scared. I'm scared. That was like, that was a year and a half before I was even pregnant with my second son. I'm a planner. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so, so we get pregnant, I'm, I'm pregnant with my son. I did find a midwife who will deliver babies in a hospital, but I'm still scared because I know I'm fudging a little bit by getting this midwife, right? I know that I am, um, a little bit willful around that. So anyway, so every month I have to go in for my checkup as a pregnant woman. And every month I have to process my fear before, during, and after my appointment because I'm still scared and there's still this obstacle in me and I know I have to get it out of the way and I'm stubborn. So I'm processing it all the time. And to make things worse, the waiting area for this doctor who that my midwife worked with had these posters in his office talking about like varicose veins and cosmetic surgery. And like, this is, this is the most insulting place for a pregnant woman to sit that I've ever been in in my entire life. And it would, not only was I scared, but I was mad. Uh -oh. And it just stirred like, my poor child, this poor kid. And I was just like, I cannot even believe I'm sitting here. I want to say something. And you know, I was just a kid then. You know, that's a long time ago. But so it would just give me something to process over and over and over again. And I was kind of getting better at it. I was kind of resigning myself. I didn't like it, but I was scared. And I was always watching out for, for her to tell me that thing that was wrong that was going to make me have to be in the hospital instead of in my home. And she didn't do home births. She just did hospital births. So I didn't have a choice at that point. But I was still looking for that thing, like, what's going to go wrong? So I had to process that every time. And, and over time, I just started accepting it. And I was changing. I was changing a lot. I was changing and I was saying, okay, well, if this is what it's supposed to be, help me make peace with if something does go wrong. Not hoping for it, not praying for it, but let me be okay if something does because this is the path and if this is what my guidance is saying, then it's right and it knows what it's talking about and I apparently do not. And so I would, I would make peace with, well, if something does happen, I just want my baby to be safe. That's the most important thing. I would like to be safe if, if that's in the cards. I would like to be safe. I want my baby to be safe. So I guess, I guess I'm okay with whatever happens needs to happen. So this was my process. And then my son and his little soul, big soul, 
either wanted to be a Leo and not a Cancer, or just had a lot of compassion for what I was going through and gave me a couple of false labor moments. So I went to the hospital twice with false labor before he was born. So I got some practice in. It was awesome. Uh, it was really great. I, I got to know some of the nurses. I got to visualize the place I was going to be in. Like, this is all right. This is not so bad. So by the time we went in for the delivery, I was so cool. Greg and I went to Target. We went shopping beforehand. We're like, yeah, come on, let's go and have a baby. And that's it. Everything got started, and in an hour and two minutes, he was born. No problems. No problems. So then you think, well, why did I have to go through all that? I, if you if you can't tell by the way, like what I've said during this story so far, and how rigid I was, let me assure you. Let me assure you that it's ten times more than you can tell from what I'm saying. <laughs> and there was nothing else that I held at that time that closely that could have done the work inside of me that that process did. I had to let go of everything that I thought was right about doctors about Western medicine, about childbirth, and how we do it in our country. I had to let go of thinking that I was right about anything, not just in this realm of childbirth. It went across the board. I realized I do not know. I personal Lynn does not know the right thing. Even though it turned out, it turned out the way, kind of the way I wanted, just a different location, right? It turned out just fine. But I would not change that process for anything. I hold that experience of that year of fear so dearly to me. Not because of the fear. Well, yeah, because of the fear. Because if that fear wasn't there, I wouldn't have gotten off my, my shtick about that. And then I wouldn't be able to help anybody because now as a therapist, somebody comes into my office and I already know I don't know. There are things that I can do, but if I, if I knew and if I held on so tightly, whether it's in my work or as a parent or as a friend or as anything, if I think I'm... Doing this talk, this talk is totally different than the 9 o'clock one. Not totally, I've got some, you know, a few stories here and there, but, but I'm different sharing this now than I was at 9 o'clock, and if I wasn't that way, I'd probably be like babbling about something you guys don't even need to hear, but for whatever reason, this is what it's about. It's about overcoming obstacles. It's about, it's okay to have obstacles. It's okay to have failures. It's okay, it's part of the process. If I didn't fail at having my son born at home, I would still be an annoying, rigid earth mother. <laughs> and you know, that's only fun to be around for so long. <laughs> and only if you agree with her, right? If you don't, she will love you, trust me. Ugh, ugh, yeah, so glad, so glad. So think about what your commitment is. Think about what's going to stand in your way that you know of. Maybe because it's happened before, or maybe because you can feel it and haven't wanted to address it. But just embrace it. Yeah, there are going to be, I'm making this commitment to myself, and there are going to be obstacles in my way, and I'm going to embrace them and move with them, and I'm going to be a different person by the time I accomplish my goal. By the time I fulfill my commitment, I'm going to be a different person. And isn't that exciting? Isn't that wonderful? Because as we're true to ourselves, all that happens is unfolding beauty. The beauty that we are. That's worth it. That is totally worth it. 
So let's touch into that right now. Touch into that love that cradles us through all of this. That divine love, that cosmic comfort, and that infinite resource of the capital R. That resource providing all of our needs, providing everything that we could possibly need on this journey. We tap into it, we feel it, it fills us, feeds us, and fosters that fulfillment of any desire we could possibly come up with. But like that North Star, it can guide us, but we do our part. We make it happen. We are the hands, the feet, the mouths. The heart of God in action. And we do our part. And for this infinite resource, we are truly grateful. And we say thank you, God. Thank you for always being here. Thank you for knowing better. Thank you for teaching, stretching, growing us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. <coughs> when we tap into the light within us, Right now, and how do we do that? We look for the place in our body space where we feel it. Find that center. And if you're not able to feel it, then visualize it. What does it seem like it would be? Sometimes it feels right in the center of our hearts, sometimes we feel that groundedness of our center <coughs> in the place that we're sitting or our feet on the ground. That cosmic energy that created us and abides in us is always there. Ready to feed us as we pay attention to it. So we tap into that energy right now. sensation of love cradling you. Surrounding you, holding you. Protecting you. Wanting, waiting, hoping, encouraging you to see that you're safe, you are whole, you are perfect.
This love is our resource. Infinite. experience of this love can be our measuring stick for life. When we tap into this love, we feel the calmness, the peace, the safety, the love. So when we are experiencing something that doesn't feel like this, something for me to see, something for me to heal, something for me to do something about. Let me tap into my inner resource and be guided through this. So it is. 